Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Hope all of you are well. We've been studying together in the second epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. And in our last study, we were in chapter 10, somewhere around verse 7. As we got into chapter 10, uh, which followed a... Uh, a quite detailed uh, explanation of God's ministry of grace uh, in the lives of His people and how He meets our needs. We see God the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. It looks, at least to me, it looks as if he is beginning a treatment, a, an address, a, uh, a treatise, if you will, uh, on explaining the importance of God's Word in the lives of those there at Corinth. Now, I'm kind of getting off on the wrong foot here. I, here's what I would like to do. I would like for you all to try to imagine, if you can, being born in the first century uh, as a Jew, uh, raised, educated as a Jew, into the born into the Jewish faith. The church was a mystery. You came to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, or you didn't. And in the early church, there was a mixture of Judaism and Christianity right from the start, naturally so, because Christianity sprung out of Judaism. So here comes this Messiah. Nothing, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. And imagine if you will, to, if you can today, if someone came and to, to you and said, look, Christianity now it's, it was Christianity, now it's something different. Try to imagine what it was like being a Jew back then, raised as a Jew, and now all of a sudden there's this new thing, Christianity. And try and imagine today someone coming to you and saying there's something new besides Christianity. There's always the big question. There's always, always has been the big question. Who do we believe? Who do we put our trust in? Who do we listen to? Is it some short, little stocky, little stubby, uh, bald-headed, bow-legged uh, guy named Paul who probably stuttered? Is that who we listen to? Now, I say that not to be funny. Uh, many credible Bible scholars believe today, in fact, much of modern uh, uh, Christianity today believes that that's what we're going to be looking at here in the text. Paul was nothing pleasant to the eye. You know, never mind the fact that verse 7 begins with, do you look on things after the outward appearance? And then we get down just several verses later to verse 10. For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. I think the text is clearly going to show us that there were those there who didn't understand fully and completely that God had, as, as the Holy Spirit revealed in previous uh, verses, that, and to the Corinthians, that God chose Paul to complete the Word of God. To complete. And that opens up a whole 
one hour, two hour session where that we discuss the meaning of that. Dearly beloved, I don't believe that Jesus ha has anything to say to us today that He hasn't already said in His Word. And God the Holy Spirit chose Paul to bring the Gospel to the Gentiles. And He chose Paul to complete the canon, the official canon. But whatever you, you believe about other books, God chose Paul to complete the Word of God. As we started out here in chapter 10, we see Paul beseeching them by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And I pointed out how that, that just doesn't seem to be the acceptable norm today. It's not by the gentleness and the meekness of Christ. It's by, it's by, it's by force. who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold towards you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, well, who's the some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Obviously, there were those who thought Paul was on the wrong path that if there was, there was anything carnal or fleshly about our relationship with God, it had to be what Paul was preaching. I don't know how many times during the span of the years that I've been a Christian that I've received the same accusation, many of you I'm sure have as well, Well, that's, uh, you know, just, okay, you're un you say you're un we're under grace, Steve. We can just go out and sin all we want. You know, they look at God's grace as carnal. There are Christians who believe, and they're, they're truly Christians. They're God's children, and they look at grace as something, just pure grace, God alone, by faith alone, Christ alone, the Word alone. Well, that's, that's the wrong way to go. Paul had confidence to withstand that. And he goes on, as I pointed out, I believe in the previous video, that we, though we walk in flesh, we live in flesh, we don't war after the, the flesh, that is, the old man, law. Our weapons aren't the same, our instruments aren't the same as, as the world uses. That, that speaks a lot, really heavy, folks, toward uh, the Crusades, all of the, mili all of the military, the militant Christianity, militant Islam, militant any, any religion that goes at war at, you know, goes at each other's throats, you know, thinking they're doing God's service. You're riding a horse. You're wielding a sword. You got a big red cross painted on. On, got a got a fight. You know. For the right to be a Christian, folks, we don't walk according to the flesh. We walk in flesh, but we don't war after the flesh. And our weapons are not carnal. They're not fleshly. It's not law but mighty. Grace is mighty. God is mighty. The flesh is not. The flesh is weak. To the pulling down of strongholds, and I pointed out how that I believe that, that you can see in, in the actual uh, Greek text, this is reasonings. I would call it human reasonings. This is what we tear down the Word of God tears down those human reasoning. It is a defense. God, the Holy Spirit, is defending His Word here as being the source of true life 
and true victory, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. That's the Word of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And though that's, that certainly includes us, I believe the context bears out that every knee shall bow, having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. That takes us up to verse 7. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? It's interesting. I mean, if you followed through us this in our studies here, you've seen we saw early on it was, you know, well, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, you know, uh, people today, you know, I am of this person, I'm of this, I'm of Steve, I'm of, you know, please don't do that. Has Christ been divided? No. We're of Christ. If any man trusts to himself, says Paul, says the Holy Spirit through Paul, that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he's Christ, even so are we Christ. We belong to Christ. For though I should glory or boast somewhat more of our authority, and that's the, that's where I, when I read that, I, it takes me back to God choosing Paul to complete the Word of God. You know, you, they had to be people, there had to have been people, dearly beloved, back then, who were saying, who do we listen to? Who do we listen to? which the Lord has given us for edification. Edification. And not for your destruction. Paul says, I don't need to be ashamed of that. Verse 9, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you, that is, frighten you away, scare you away, is what the, the Greek word infers, implies. These letters, what letters? The letters we're studying. Scare them away. For his letters say they, who's the they? Well, obviously the they were, are, were some that were there who were saying something. What were they saying? They say that his letters the very ones we're reading, the very ones we're studying, are weighty and powerful. That's verse 10. Weighty and powerful. I'm, I'm going to zero in on the word weighty here in the original text. The Greek reads, it's uh, barei, it's weighty, these people were saying that Paul's letters were heavy. They were weighty. They were heavy. They were burdensome. They were meta metaphorically, they were violent. They were oppressive. I'm convinced that that's the thought that the Holy Spirit intends to convey to us here. We're, we're looking at a history lesson in a sense. We're, we're trying to put ourselves, folks, back there at that, at that time. Listen, dearly beloved, if we just go through Scripture and we just, as we begin reading and we go down through whatever section of Scripture, if all we're going to do is just think about the present application and never think about the context, never think about the, the historical context, we don't really get the gist of what is being said. We need a picture of what is going on there. And, and God, the Holy Spirit, is painting a beautiful picture if we take time to look at it. 
and not read our own prejudices in it or our own presuppositions into it. They thought his letters were weighty, heavy, burdensome, violent, oppressive. That's how that word is used in the New Testament. Weighty and strong. That's our word iskurai, iskurai, iskurai in the Greek. Mighty, powerful. It's uh, it's it it describes it. it a combat type strength and we've been looking at we you know how this military picture of warfare that God uses as a as a simile to describe our basically our service our walk in the Lord having been ignored the speech having been ignored is how the Greek reads when we finish off verse 10 here. The presence of the body weak, weak. That's without strength, physically or morally, it's used. Infirm, sick, sickly. Okay? without vigor, without strength, living in a state of weakness, a lack of necessary resources, insufficient, without adequate strength, feeble, frail, sickly. There were some who were saying this concerning Paul. This word speech is logos. It's where we get the word word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was, was with God and the word was God. That's logos. His word. The speech. I have a hard time separating God's word from that word logos there. Having been ignored is really literally what the Greek says to uh, despise treat with contempt to set it not ignore despise so basically in a nutshell well here's two here's the two positions if you want to take the well-traveled road here then we're what we're looking at is we're looking at a uh, a short, stubby, bald-headed, bow-legged, uh, sickly kind of a guy who stuttered or had some speech defect. And, uh, and that seems kind of odd to me. It took me a while to see this, but it seems kind of odd that most of the commentators that I read would take it from the physical outward appearance standpoint when verse 7 says do you look on things after the outward appearance and then we're, we're then we're going to get down here to uh, verse 10 and we're going to think that what the holy spirit is, is telling us is that the problem that they had with paul was physical it was it was had to do with outward appearances Perhaps so. I, I, you know, I'm not saying that that's not the case. I don't see that. I think that there were those there who were saying, look, Paul, what you're teaching is carnal. You're going down the wrong path. I don't know who we ought to be listening to. Paul, Paul, Apollo, Cephas, I don't know. But... I don't, I, I don't, I'm not sure it's you. Never mind the fact God chose Paul to complete the canon. 
But I, I don't think it's you. And I think basically you're the carnal one. You're the fleshly one. I don't know how many times I've been accused of that. Paul doesn't want to frighten them away by these letters. He didn't want to terrify them by these letters. Because, you know, there, there, there were some there who were saying, obviously, the text makes it clear, there were some who were saying that these are, man, his, his word is kind of hard, kind of rough. Kind of hard to take. I suppose it would be. You know, if you're, if you're a Jew, you've been raised as a Jew, you're a Jewish Christian, you come to believe in the Messiah, and then, but you've got to throw out all, you've got you to, no, we're no longer under law, but we're under grace now. Man, I don't know about that, Paul. I mean, I'm not so sure about that. Got to be something wrong here. You know, I'm mean, sure you were a, a Pharisee of Pharisees. Yeah, you could probably quote the first five books of the Bible uh, forward and backwards, but doesn't mean you, you can't de go off the, the rails here. Yeah, you may have some notoriety, some credibility, some, you know, you may be well known to many. But I think it's the, we're looking at the content of what Paul was preaching, which was the Word of God and the weakness that's associated with that because we don't war according to the flesh, even though we live in the flesh. We don't use those same weapons of warfare. The same tactics. The same instruments. The words there's instruments. His presence is weak. Who's, who's this guy? What, what was it they said of our Lord? Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. And His speech contemptible there's nothing new under the sun folks <laughs> if we keep it in context we're not going back and looking at a group of believers there at Corinth in or, in or around Corinth or some of the other churches uh, familiar with the Christians at Corinth or, or just the general public, you know, population at, at large, just every believer, any believer, every believer who believed in Christ. We're not looking at some of them who are sort of got it, you know, in their minds. They, they need to discredit Paul because of, of how he looks. Or how he talks, and by that I mean not the content of what he's saying, but the way that he's saying. You know, maybe he stuttered. Maybe he had some kind of a, a speech defect. Granted, Paul went through a lot of hardships. We all know what those were. It is quite possible. I, I don't. I'm not suggesting that Paul wasn't infirm in some way i'm not suggesting that he he wasn't sickly i just don't think that was the focus of those that were accusing paul or concerned at least in this matter about the word that was being spoken folks we don't look outward on outward appearances. Your brother or your sister in Christ could be the guy that's uh, living out all by, behind the liquor store by the dumpsters because he's homeless and he doesn't have a place to live and he's, and he's hungry. Or he's in prison.
Those are outward appearances for sure, but we don't look on outward appearances when it comes to judging one another as far as whether they are, they seem to be kind of making the cut here. You know, what we, what we expect Christians to be like, to, 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 to act like. And usually that's the way that, you know, you know, each one of us has our own, you know. Well, to me, you know, a Christian doesn't do that. Well, to me, a Christian, you know, doesn't do this. Or should do this. There's nothing fleshly about any of this. None of it. Never has been, never will. Flesh in the New Testament, unless it is used in the sense of the 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 uh, this clay vessel that that I been given that I, I live in, you know, where you you know pinch yourself that you know is law means law, flesh is law. We don't operate, we don't function according to the flesh. If you're, if you're going to judge anything, if, if you're out there wondering, who do I listen to? You know, I, I listened to this, this preacher, man, he just for years, man. And he, but then, I, you know, he, he kind of led me off in the wrong direction. Now I'm looking for someone else to tell me what the truth is. There's, you would not believe the number of Christians today who are wandering around aimlessly not knowing how to, how to look for the answers to the questions that they have. Not knowing who to trust. I think it's an enormously sad thing. I always have. That God's Word is so neglected. It's our only source of strength, of faith. If we didn't have it, we wouldn't know who we were in Christ. We wouldn't know all the blessings that we've received in Christ. We just got through looking at a long lesson on how God works in the lives of His people in meeting their needs through the opera, an operation of grace which we can participate in. Where that we give, we serve, we work, we worship, we, we, we function for w in whatever capacity for the betterment of, for the growth of the body of Christ. And we do it. Why? Why? To accomplish some goal. No. You, you may never accomplish that goal. To save souls. No. If you're going to the mission field to save souls, don't go. If you're going because you love Him, go. By all means, go. Give as your heart has in your heart. God has, has, God has put it in your heart to give. As often and how and how however often however much as you've purposed in your own heart, it's a ministry that meets both the needs of the one the one who gives, as one as, as well as the one that receives. There's, there was there's, there was something lacking in the lives of both, and God met that, and it was by grace. Why wouldn't God the Holy Spirit begin? a treatment here, a section, a portion of His Word more than He's coming to the defense of His own Word and the effectiveness that it has to bring down mighty strongholds. All of those human reasons, all of those that logic, those thoughts of, of human reasoning in which anything that would go contrary to the Word of God. 
No, it, it was not. It's not the never. Never is it the Holy Spirit's desire to tear us down, but to build us up. That's what I also see in verse eight. Edification, not for destruction. God never touches your life except to be for your ultimate good. Whatever you're going through, and many people, many of us are going through some very severe trials, whatever they are, you need to know. Well, you need to know a lot of things. But you need to know that it is for God, you have a loving Heavenly Father who has your best in mind, who always has your best in mind. He doesn't allow any, anything to touch your life except it be for your ultimate good. And if you're that prodigal son who's gone off in a far country, wasted his inheritance, you know how the story ends, folks. He was always his father's son. God's word, we saw it early on, is meant to comfort and encourage us. And if and if what, what wherever you're going to church, where, whoever you're listening to, radio station, TV broadcast, YouTube, whoever it is, if they are not comforting you and encouraging you, I don't I don't see how they're 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 teaching the, the truth of this book. Because that's what God's Word does. Is it comforts us. It encourages us. It directs us. It guides us. Second Corinthians, first and second, first and second Corinthians, dearly beloved, it is is beyond marvelous. I mean, as far as is the, you know, just the content of these two epistles go. Right from the outset, we saw that, that God is presenting to us the most, a group of Christians who are the most carnal of anybody. It's, it's not by working and, and slaving and through self-effort and all this grinding, you know, uh, burdensome, you know, yoke of law that we accomplish anything for Christ. We, uh, it's interesting how the Lord uses, you know, uh, you know, these metaphors, I guess metaphors you could call them, but how that He... You can actually see the progression. We're, we're told to sit, to stand, to walk, to run, and to rest. Now, whether that's... Uh, I, don't, I don't believe those are all in succession. It's like, well, we, we were sitting, and then we got up and to stand. Now we're no longer sitting. They all work together. It's, it's kind of like the fruit of the Spirit. If, if one characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit is not there, none are there. God doesn't uh, offer out, you know, up. He doesn't grant you, you know, little bits of His life piecemeal. It's all or nothing. You know, like, uh, you know, Hey, I got to work on patience this week. You know, when I get that down, then I'll work on, you know, obedience and, you know, or whatever. I'll work on the long suffering. I, I'm really, I, I, I'm in real need of that, you know, working on that. That's a tough one, man. I got to be uh, trusting God in situations that are beyond your control. You know, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not very good at that, so I'm going to work hard at that. And when I get that one down pat, then I'm going to go to another. I'll, I'll, I'll work on my love for the brethren, you know. It's fruit 
of the Spirit. The beauty of it is, as I said, if, if, if one is, if they're not all there, if one's missing, none are there. But we don't come to, to, to realize the importance and understand the, the need for walking in the Spirit if we're walking in the flesh. We, we live in flesh, we do, but we don't walk according to the flesh. We don't function out of the flesh. There never would have been a Christianity at all if God intended us to walk according to the flesh. Look, I love you all. I truly do. We'll pick up here next time, probably at verse uh, 11. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.